And after that passed, you had DJs that were very nice men, but not necessarily musically uh, smart. And so they started playing what they knew, and you know, just uh, the whole thing went went down in quality, I think. And also, I think maybe economics had something to do with it, because suddenly kids of 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 had enough money to influence a market. So your quality, that's not going to uphold all the things you are. You know, that's pretty hard for a 13-year-old to understand, whereas Heartbreak Hotel is not, not hard at all. Well, I know that you curtailed your career to raise your family, and you have two very talented children, both very, very talented musicians. I think so. Amy's a pretty good singer, and Tim is a good musician, but there's not very many places for him to perform what they do well. Tim is doing a good job of running our little record company, but he doesn't get to play that much, and he's a good player, good at what he does, and so is Aim. Do you have perfect pitch? No. I just assume that you would because you're famous for always being so... I'm a very careful singer, and I have good relative pitch <laughs> about singing in tune. But no, I don't have perfect pitch. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure that I would want it. It takes one part of singing away, and that is, I've always said you don't sing an A-flat the same as you sing a G-sharp. <laughs> I mean, there's just the what's around it that makes it different. It's always in tune, but there's something about it I think is absolutely true. And if you have perfect pitch, you're going to sing that note the same no matter what's around you. It's not as pretty as if you can shimmer into that uh, yeah, chord. Yeah. Johnny Mercer, one of the great songwriters of the century, mm. yet by all accounts a difficult man when he was not sober. Oh, when, when John drank, he was a mess. The best way to handle it was just to shun John when he was drinking, mm. be someplace else. But such a monumental talent, what he could do with words. He was literally two people. From when he was sober and when he was drinking. I heard a story, which I'd love if you'd corroborate it, about um, Johnny sending flowers or roses. He would send roses. to After chewing someone out, some, some terrible, the next morning he would send the roses or by way of uh, apologizing. And he never got out of line with me, never until one night he started and I could see the direction it was going. So I just stopped him and I said, John, I don't want any of your roses tomorrow morning. <laughs> and he stopped. It seemed to be so easy for him to write lyrics. I know he had yeah. to sweat, but the volume of verses and choruses he could turn out on a subject was yeah. extraordinary. And the fact that he could I guess he could do it all because he could write the most tender love lyrics and yet come out with Accentuate the Positive, which is just wonderful. What a man. Well, is there anything else about Ballad of the Blues that you'd like to say? Maybe if I just read some of these titles, maybe it'll, if it's a comment, fine. If you don't want to say anything, fine, too. The first sequence is The Blues is an Old, Old Story. And in that, you do the street cries, which are reminiscent to me of Porgy and Bess. Of yeah, the, uh, uh -huh. Beautifully yeah. done, but different than John Henry. Sometimes I feel. Yeah, oh, that's a satisfying song to sing. Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, because yeah. these are pieces that I've heard since I was a child. And, sure. And uh, I like them, but I was never crazy about them, mm -hmm. you know, because it's sort of unsophisticated in a way Very, that... Yeah that uh, changes when I hear it in this context. Uh-huh. I think that was one of the things I loved about the album was the framing of it gave me an opportunity to sing so many different and wonderful songs. The Blues is a Tale of Trouble, Kansas City Blues. Yeah. Memphis Blues. Was that W.C. Handy? Memphis? I'm not sure. I think it is. We, uh, talked to John about using that ending on uh, that was from originally from a, an arrangement we did with John. Oh. So Paul called him and said, you know, she's recording this and explained the whole thing to him and said, you know, is it okay if we use that ending that uh, da 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 John said, yes, so we put that on there. It's one of my favorite codas. <laughs> it's just great.
Then the third sequence is called The Blues is a Traveling Thing. And He's Gone Away has always been one of my favorite yeah, songs. Yeah, that's a beauty. It's so evocative of early Americana in a mm -hmm. way that it just creates such a sense of longing. Yes, doesn't it, though? There's some of those songs that I don't know what about. There's one in the uh, folk song album, Shenandoah, that my sister's, she says she drives down. She plays it all the time. She loves it, but she just plays it and drives down the street weeping. She <laughs> just, what am I weeping at? It's a beautiful song, and you do it so well. But I've had more people say that that makes them cry. Seems like when it comes in the morning, every night when the sun goes in, yeah. And then I love how in the last sequence you did two contemporary songs, Lover Man and Blues in the Night. Uh -huh. And again, yeah. the way they weave effortlessly out Into of... Into the thing, yeah. Oh, it's just, just wonderful. There's one other thing I'd like to ask you about because yeah. um, they're very important in my life, and I know that they are in yours. Jonathan and Darlene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when I first became aware of those recordings, I felt as if a new world had opened up to me. Yes, it's another world. <laughs> <laughs> you were speaking earlier about uh, perfect pitch and you know, singing always <laughs> on you know, proper pitch, and I was going to say, well, I seem to recall there might have been some instances. <laughs> well, you see, perfect pitch would have ruled out uh, <laughs> Darlene. <laughs> Paul, for years, had had a thing that, a special chorus of Stardust, which was... Jonathan, just awful. But it was it was a favorite with a lot of people. I know Jeannie Martin used to always, whenever we would see them, but always request that Paul play his <laughs> version of Stardust, which is just pitiful. <laughs> they were at, went to a, a record convention in Key West, and uh, they went after some of the meetings. These was Columbia executives. And they went to this little bar in Key West after the meetings were finished. And there was a cocktail pianist there who, as Paul says, you know, what, what more could you ask for a pianist playing in Key West? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, he was pretty much uh, Jonathan. And uh, so after he left and went home for the evening, Paul got up and played this thing of Stardust, which, as I say, is perfectly terrible. A couple of the guys at, from Columbia said, you know, you've got to record that. You know, Paul thought they were joking. Well, of course they weren't. They said, you know, you should do an album. So he started thinking about it, and, you know, and he thought, I cannot do an album all by myself. So that's when he enlisted me. So we went from there, made the first album, and uh, we wound up making five albums of these two people. I have them all. <laughs> oh, yes, I have them well, all. Well, I tell you, Jack Benny was a big fan I think he finally, in that first album, he bought about 25 copies as gifts for people. <laughs> Did you ever have complaints from any songwriters whose songs you interpreted that way? The Bee Gees did not like my version of... <laughs> Staying Alive! <laughs> you know, hoo, 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 which, I don't know, says something about the Bee Gees. Oh, my. Do you still sing? No, I don't, because... It's not as good as it used to be. And when I say that, I mean uh, to satisfy myself. Christmas when the family is all here and we sing up a storm. But uh, it ain't what it used to be. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Well, I think about certain entertainers who went on too long. People seem to remember the latter years and it eclipses the good stuff. Yeah. A voice, I mean, it's not uh, an indestructible thing. With age... It just doesn't stand up to what it was, and why should I displease myself and my audience? And I, as I say, I, I had a lot of years of uh, a lot of fun. Well, you can hear it in the records. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, gosh, it's a pleasure. I enjoyed it. This was absolutely wonderful and a thrill. Thank you. <laughs>